All right. Lena, a 30 year old client has been seeing a social worker for six months, primarily to address issues of anxiety and low self-esteem. During therapy, Lena reveals that she is in a relationship that is cynically abusive. Lena describes periods where tension escalate in her relationship, characterized by verbal arguments in her partner's increasingly controlling behavior. These periods are followed by incidents of physical abuse. After these incidents, her partner becomes apologetic, promising change and showering Lena with affection, which leads to a temporary phase of calm and stability before the cycle repeats. The social worker recognizes this pattern as the cycle of abuse and understands the importance of addressing it directly to support Lena's well-being and safety. What is the social worker's best response to support Lena and understanding her situation and planning next steps? So we have A, focus on the tension building phase to help Lena identify early signs of escalation and develop strategies to de-escalate the situation. We have B, concentrate on the incident phase to encourage Lena to leave the relationship immediately after any physical abuse occurs. We have C, address the recon reconciliation phase to help Lena see the manipulative aspects of her partner's apologies and promises to change. D, discuss the calm phase to reinforce the idea that these periods are peace, are temporary and part of the abuse cycle. So, of course, we know the KSA is around cycles of abuse when it comes to domestic violence. So, let's first look at A. Do we keep A or do we take it out? I'm going to take a brief look at the chat. You guys feel free to blow it up. Who is not up here? A, do we keep it or throw it out? I will keep A. Okay. B, do we keep it or throw it out? Cost B. Toss okay. It. C, do we keep it or throw it out? Toss it. Yeah, toss it. D, do we keep it or throw it out? Mm, I want to keep D for now. Just keep it. Yeah. Keep it for now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I want to kind of just go back and I'm going to break this down because I want you guys to really look at who's your client, what is a presenting problem. Now, here, just a recap really quickly. We have 30-year-old Lena. She's been seeing a social worker for six months. She needs to address issues of anxiety and low self-esteem. So don't stray away from that part of the problem. That's we got to keep that in mind. Now, during therapy, Lena reveals she's in a relationship in a uh, kind of a cycle that's abusive. That's also part of the presenting problem, right? Mm -hmm. So we have anxiety, low self-esteem, therapy. She's in a relationship that has a cycle of abuse. Now, she describes periods where tensions escalate in a relationship, which is typical. These periods are followed by incidents of physical abuse. After these incidents, her partner becomes apologetic, promises change, and showering Lena with affection, which leads to a temporary phase of calm and stability before the cycle repeats, which is important. The social worker recognizes this pattern as the cycle of abuse and understands the importance of addressing it directly to support Lena's well-being and safety. What I want you guys to really pay attention to is the part where she says, the social worker recognizes this pattern as a cycle of abuse, which is the KSA, and understands the importance of addressing it directly to support Lena's well-being and safety. Now, I need you guys to go back and look at the two that you're stuck between tension building phase and calm phase. And you need to eliminate one of those. Remember, best first means the same thing. I'm going to go back and look at the chat as well. I would toss A and keep D. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So toss A and keep D. So I'm going to tell y'all right now, both of those are actually out. The answer would be C, reconciliation phase. Yeah, I thought that. Hot 
Why, why you didn't say nothing? I, well, I had to go back. You know, I have to go back and read it two or three times. And this is <laughs> so, you know, I, I know. <laughs> I know. It's okay. Miss Hunter says, oh, geez. <laughs> in the chat so let's go back the piece that i want you guys to pay attention to was when she said she understands the importance of addressing directly to support leaders well-being and safety in the question it says what is the social worker's best response to support lena and understanding her situation and planning next steps a lot of times with people that are in domestic violence relationships they fall into that cycle of when things go from the incident to that reconciliation and the manipulation that happens. Can you guys hear me? So let's break down and look at the rationales one by one and hopefully you guys will see. So the correct response, can you guys hear me? Yeah, Hello? I think you was on mute at first. Can you hear, yes. Yes, I can hear you Shar, but your um, connection is spotty. So like every yeah. other word is coming out. Yeah. Oh, th that's not good. Okay, let me see here. And that's because I was moving around. Can you guys hear me now? Much better. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to be as still as a statue then. So <laughs> what I was saying was that I'm going to go through the rationale to help you understand that the application piece with the cycle of abuse was since she is going back and forth between the reconciliation phase, most of the time people are stuck in that trauma and they usually align and connect with their abuser. So during that calm phase or reconciliation phase, she's less likely to leave. We need to make sure she's educated about the manipulation that takes place and the change that most likely is promised but doesn't happen. So correct response would be the reconciliation phase. It's a critical part of the cycle of abuse where the abuser often uses apologies, affection and promises of change to maintain control of the victim. So by focusing on this phase, the social worker can help Lena recognize the manipulation tactics used by her partner, which might empower her to question the sincerity of the reconciliation and the likelihood of real change. Now, this awareness is essential for Lena to make informed decisions about her relationship and to consider steps towards safety and leaving the abusive situation. Option A, tension building, while it's important for Lena to recognize the signs of escalation, focusing solely on de-escalation strategies does not address the root cause of the abuse or empower her to take steps towards ending the cycle. It may also inadvertently place the responsibility on Lena to prevent abuse, which is not appropriate. Option B, incident, encouraging immediate departure post-incident can be part of safety planning, but focusing solely on this phase doesn't provide Lena with a comprehensive understanding of the cycle of abuse or the psychological manipulation involved that might make the leaving the relationship challenging. Now, option D, calm, discusses the calm phase is valuable in highlighting the temporary nature of peace in the cycle. However, without addressing the manipulation in the reconciliation phase, there might not be enough emphasis on the dynamics that persuade victims to stay, reducing the effectiveness of their intervention itself. So by addressing the reconciliation phase, it would be key to help Lena gain insight to understanding the full dynamics of the cycle of abuse including the psychological aspects that may influence her decision. We need to make sure that she's at that point in her journey where she could go back because everything is calm. We need to make sure that her safety and the possibility of leaving the abusive relationship with appropriate support and planning if she chooses to. So it's almost like saying you wanna educate them first because here she's more likely at this point to go back to her abuser right now because everything is kind of in that calm phase and the cycle is going to start over but she needs to gain an insight if we're worried about her well-being and her safety remember that in the cycle of abuse more likely than not when everything is calm they're going to stay but since we want to make sure her safety is of the utmost priority we need to make sure we educate her about what happens during that phase because to me out of all phases 
the reconciliation phase is also the most dangerous because they most likely will stay when things are calm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Any other questions about that? I want to make sure that's really clear because I knew that was a little tricky. But the two parts I wanted to pay attention to was the application of knowing the cycle of abuse, what her presenting op um, issues were, the anxiety, the low self-esteem, and the cycle of abuse that they talk about in the first part of the STEM while she's in therapy. Based on my knowledge of the cycle of abuse, I need to be able to apply what I know about if we're focused on safety, we need to make sure we educate our client about that part of the cycle of abuse process. So hopefully that makes sense. Now that would be in human behavior, diversity in the environment, 27% of the master's exam, about 24% of the clinical exam, and about 24% of the bachelor's exam. When you're looking at a question such as this, and this is the application question, it's not going to just be not so much knowing what the first most appropriate thing is. You want to make sure you know what are they testing in the scenario. And in this case, it was a cycle of abuse domestic violence, and whenever they talk about that, at least in my material, the focus and emphasis is always on the safety of the client and educating them so they can make an informed decision about next steps. All right, so we're going to go to the next one. Eli, a 42-year-old client, has been working with a social worker for several months to address issues of depression and social isolation. In the course of therapy, Eli has gradually opened up about his past traumas and current struggles, but he remains guarded and occasionally expresses doubt about the therapy process. During one session, Eli shares a particular painful memory and then becomes visibly upset, apologizing for being difficult and questioning the social worker's patience with him. The social worker recognizes this moment as crucial for reinforcing the therapeutic relationship and ensuring that Eli feels supported and understood in his healing journey. Which component of a strong therapeutic relationship should the social worker prioritize to effectively support Eli? A, demonstrate empathy by acknowledging Eli's feelings and assuring him that his reactions are understandable given his experiences. B, offer warmth by maintaining a positive demeanor and reassuring Eli of the social worker's commitment to helping him. C, express authenticity, genuineness by sharing a personal story that mirrors Eli's experiences to show understanding. D, reinforce trust by reminding Eli of the confidentiality agreement and emphasizing the safe space that therapy provides. All right, so first let's look at A. Do we keep A or do we throw it out? Keep it. We can keep it for now. Okay, B, do we keep it or throw it out? I will keep it. C, do we keep it or throw it out? Toss it. Toss it. Okay. And D, do we keep it or throw it out? Mm. Mm. I didn't see this answer at first. <laughs> so I want, and I'm going to give you a little bit of tip here. Look at, and if I have to look at A, I would highlight or pull out empathy, just the word empathy. B, I will pull out warmth, and D, I will pull out trust. Just those three, just the interventions itself, right? What I want everybody to do in this room is I want you to go back, ask yourself, who is the client? We're just going to go through that. Eli's 42, right? He has been working with the social worker for several months to address issues of depression and isolation. So now we have mental health conditions. Now, what is his presenting problem? He's opened up about his past trauma and current struggles, but he remains guarded and occasionally expresses doubt about the therapy process. That is also, to me, a part of the problem. The other part you need to pay attention to is that Eli shares particularly painful memory and then becomes visibly upset, apologizes for being difficult, and questioning the social worker's patience with him. The other piece is recognizing that this moment is crucial for reinforcing the therapeutic relationship. I would think 
that I would need to make Eli feel safe in some way. He has extensive mm -hmm. background of trauma, depression, and social isolation. He is also very self-conscious and self-critical of himself. I want you to think about those things because mm -hmm. in the question it says, which component of a strong therapeutic relationship should the social worker prioritize to effectively support Eli? You have three left now. So what are we going to pull away now that I kind of tried to hint at what they're getting at? What can we pull away? I'm going to look at the chat too. I will talk could... A and B and keep D, but Ms. Barbara, were you talking? I was going to I was going to say keep A and keep D and toss B and C. Good. So now we're down to two. But I always tell you guys when we're down to two questions, look at what the presenting problem is again. Mm -hmm. This guy, what? which one would you do? Empathy or trust? This guy is heavily guarded. He has extensive trauma history. He's also self-critical. Think about what are the components of a therapeutic mm -hmm. relationship? What makes it work before anything? What would you need to do to help Trust. solidify the relationship? Trust. Before trust, you need empathy. And I'm going to tell you why. Since empathy is a, it's a fundamental part of the therapeutic relationship, especially in moments of vulnerability, which he is, acknowledging his feelings and validating his experiences if you do that, not only are you demonstrating the understanding and acceptance, but also helping him to feel seen and heard. It can enhance his sense of safety and encourage further openness, which is essential for the therapeutic progress. Yes, trust is essential, but it's a cornerstone of therapeutic relationship. However, Reminding Eli of the confidentiality agreement in response to his expression of vulnerability might come across as procedural and not emotionally supportive. So it wasn't the, the trust part that was the issue with that answer choice. It was the part where they talked about mm -hmm. reminding him of the confidentiality agreement, because what is that mm -hmm. going to do? Trust is built through actions and responses that show understanding empathy works mm -hmm. towards the client's feelings and experiences. Mm -hmm. right. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. The empathy. You cut off, so I missed it. Oh no! So all I'm saying, Miss Barbara, is that if we had to choose between trust and empathy, in a nutshell, demonstrating empathy for Eli would be—it's more about emotional state, his emotional state, and validation at this point. He mm -hmm. needs to feel understood and accepted. So trust, that's important. I would have picked that answer too. The only issue with that is reminding him of a confidentiality agreement is not going to make him feel safe. Okay. Okay. That was the part and the question that was the problem, mm -hmm. not the trust part. Mm -hmm. If that alone, that could be the first answer choice. But because you're talking about reminding him of a confidentiality agreement, what is that mm -hmm. going to do for somebody that's got extensive trauma? Mm -hmm. Nothing. So your best bet is to build empathy with him and demonstrate that to him to make him feel safe. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Now does that make sense? That's the only reason why that answer would be out. <laughs> okay. Now I'm looking at the chat here too. I'm trying not to laugh at y'all. Y'all y'all sounding like TikTok now. Logan says <laughs> Logan's in there. Logan, you're going to be okay. The answer's a little trippy tonight, but I got to make them hard. That's the only way you guys are going to learn. But you so do it's understand. A. It's going to be empathy, A. But you okay. do understand now, right, why yeah. it's not D. The only reason why is because of the confidentiality agreement that will not make someone feel safe, you bringing that up. Now, if that part wasn't in there, it would be trust. Hopefully that makes better sense. I know this was a tricky one. Professional relationship values and ethics. This is components of the therapeutic relationship. There are four of them. Empathy, warmth, authenticity, genuineness, and trust. 
However, in this instance, this guy needs empathy to feel connected and feel safe because without that, he's going to remain guarded and you're not going to get anywhere with your evidence-based um, interventions. Okay. I know that was tough, but we're going to go on to the next one. All right. This one is shorter, I promise. Dexter, I don't recognize you. You must be new. <laughs> um, but we're going to look at this. I'm just shouting out Dexter in the chat. So Sam, a 50-year-old client, presents to therapy reporting sleep disturbances that have been increasingly affecting his daily functioning. Sam describes episodes where he appears to be acting out his dreams. These episodes include talking, yelling, even getting out of bed and running out the room, which results in injuries such as bruise, uh, bruises and cuts. Sam's spouse, who often witnesses these episodes, reports that Sam appears to be frightened and is attempting to escape from perceived threats. These episodes occur during the later part of the night and have been escalating in frequency and intensity. Sam expresses concern and confusion about these occurrences as he has no memory of the dreams upon waking but feels exhausted and unrefreshed in the morning. Which diagnosis should the social worker consider as most likely when planning assessment, diagnosis, and treatment? We have A, non-rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder. We have B, nightmare disorder. We have C, rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. We have D, restless leg syndrome. Okay, so let's first look at knocking out what is not apparently the answer. So let's start with A. Do we keep A, non-rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder, or do we toss it? Toss it. Okay. What about B? Toss it. Okay. What about C? Do we keep it or toss it? Keep it. <laughs> Y'all like whatever. <laughs> All right. What about D? Toss it. How about say y'all better throw that out? Yeah. Oh, Dexter, you old school. I just realized Dexter said he's been around. He was around in the very beginning. That was three years ago. Dexter, well, thanks for coming back. <laughs> I thought he was new. All right, so back to this. Now, it is rapid eye movement, sleep behavior disorder. Mm -hmm. So sleep disorders are a little tricky. <laughs> Dexter says old school. <laughs> um, rapid eye movement, REM, sleep behavior disorder is characterized by the physical acting out of dreams, which can include talking, yelling, and more complex behaviors like running or punching. These episodes typically occur during REM sleep at a stage in muscle atonia, or called temporary paralysis of the muscles, should occur. It, it, prevents, it should prevent these behaviors. However, Sam is acting out his dreams, and he also can have injuries aligned closely with REM sleep behavior disorder, making it the most appropriate. Now, some people get confused between rapid eye movement, REM, and non-rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder. So this category includes sleepwalking and night terrors. He's not having that, which typically occur during the non-REM stages of sleep. If you can remember anything about that to differentiate, um, differentiate between non-rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder and rapid eye movement is that non-rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder sleepwalking and night tears. Put that next to whatever study materials or whatever you're using. It'll help you if you keep it very concise and concrete, you'll always remember it. Just a, a sidebar. Now, non-rapid eye movement sleep or arousal disorder. Also, when people have this, they experience partial arousal from deep sleep and engage in activities like walking or expressing fear. However, these episodes are not associated with dream enactment distinguishing them from Sam's symptoms. 
Of course, you guys took out nightmare disorder, option B. While nightmare disorder involves distressing dreams leading to awakening, it does not include physical acting out of dreams. Individuals remember dreams which predominantly occur during REM sleep, but they do not exhibit physical behaviors related to dreams, unlike Sam's presentation. Okay? Now, option D, I'm glad you guys crossed this one out. This one was pretty obvious. Restless leg syndrome is characterized by uncomfortable sensations in the legs and an irresistible urge to move them, primarily occurring during periods of rest or an activity and not related to dream enactment. Sam's symptoms do not align with the characteristics of restless leg syndrome as his primary concerns involve acting out dreams rather than sensations in the legs or the urge to move them. Given the specifics of Sam's case, REM sleep behavior disorder, option C, is the most fitting diagnosis directly focusing for further assessment, potential referral maybe to a sleep specialist, considering treatment options that may include medication, lifestyle adjustments to manage the symptoms and prevent injury. So this is definitely a LCSW assessment diagnosis and treatment planning, 30% of your exam. The biggest section, not so big on the masters, however, you, it's still relevant because both exams, you do get disorders in both. So you still need to know the DSM-5. The best advice I could give you guys, four categories you need to remember. I'll just give them to you. Duration, symptoms, evidence-based practices, medications. You could get questions from any four. And you're also gonna need them to separate disorders that may be similar to each other. Just like I told you about the whole REM, um, REM sleep disorder, rapid eye movement, and non-rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder. Remember that non-rapid eye movement, sleepwalking, night terrors. That's all you need to put next to it. Most likely on the exam, they're gonna emphasize that and you'll know that it's non-rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder. In this case, it's not, it's rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder physical acting out of dreams. When you study this stuff, you wanna keep the symptoms that make it different from the other very concrete, paraphrase it, that way you can remember, okay? All right, hopefully that helped. All right, let's see, what's the next one? Okay, here's the next one. Jordan, a 34-year-old client, has been working with a clinical social worker for several weeks to address symptoms of depression and low self-esteem. Throughout the sessions, Jordan has expressed persistent negative beliefs about themselves, often attributing failures in personal and professional domains to inherent flaws in their character. The social worker trained in Beck's cognitive therapy, there's your KSA, recognizes the importance of challenging these cognitive distortions, another key concept, and the potential of empowering Jordan to take an active role in their cognitive restructuring process. During a recent session, Jordan discussed a recent incident at work where they were overlooked for a project-led position. Jordan immediately concluded that this was due to their inadequacies, reinforcing their negative self-view. The social worker decides to use a specific technique to help Jordan examine the evidence for and against their belief, aiming to foster a more balanced perspective. Which technique should the social worker use to most effectively help Jordan challenge their persistent negative beliefs and develop a more balanced self-view? We have A, guided discovery, B, reabusion. Re training. I can never say that. Uh, C, decentering. D, collaborative empirism. So let's start with A. Do we keep it or do we throw it out? Keep it. B, do we keep it or throw it out? I ain't never heard that before. Throw it out. <laughs> Who said that? Who said they never heard that before? <laughs> Me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, you well, you're today. No, girl. Mm -mm. <laughs> this is all Beck cognitive therapy. That's it's right in your guide. You got it. You didn't get there yet. It's in chapter three. <laughs> yeah, <dear. laughs> um, nonetheless. So you might not be there yet. Decentering. Do we keep it or throw it out? Keep 
keep it. I didn't mess y'all up today. That's what happened. Mm-hmm. Y'all yeah. done. They're like, we didn't check out. We don't know what's <laughs> happening. What's where she get these questions from? So I'm taking C out for y'all. Okay. So I'm I'm stuck between guided discovery and co- collaborative imperialism. I think it's guided discovery. I do too. Oh, it's actually D. Oh, oh my God. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I ain't never heard of these techniques before. <laughs> I thought you was going to say DBT or something no, or DBT. <laughs> nope. This is part of Beck's cognitive therapy. These are all his key concept techniques related oh, to. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. This is what I mean when I tell people, you, Georgia, now you're one of mine. You didn't get there yet to that section. Mm-hmm. But even right. when you read through this stuff, one of the things I tell people, you want to look for key concepts related to the theory. When I'm looking at this, besides the fact that I'm looking at what his presenting problem was, depression and low self-esteem, I'm going to tell you some of the other key concepts that I see. Back cognitive therapy, that's one. Cognitive distortions, that's two. Cognitive restructuring process, that's three. And then when she says use a specific technique to help Jordan examine the evidence for and against their belief, aiming to foster a more balanced perspective. That was basically the definition of collaborative imperialism. Because even when they get to the question, it says, which technique should the social worker use to most effectively help Jordan challenge their pers- uh, persistent negative beliefs and develop a more balanced self-view? That would only pertain to collaborative imperialism. It's not used very often, but it is one of their key techniques underneath Beck. So I'm going to go through them. Collaborative empirism is a cornerstone of Beck's cognitive therapy, emphasizing the therapist and client working together to empirically test the validity of the client's beliefs. This approach involves jointly examining evidence for and against the client's negative beliefs and considering alternative explanations. In Jordan's case, Collaborative empirism would involve the social worker and Jordan working together to evaluate the evidence supporting Jordan's belief about being overlooked for the project lead to to personal inadequacies and exploring other potential reasons. This technique directly targets Jordan's cognitive distortions by encouraging an empirical and balanced examination of thoughts and beliefs. So when you think of collaborative empirism, all you have to remember is that is examining someone's evidence for and against their belief and it helps them to find a more balanced perspective or self-view very keep it very very concrete and paraphrase when you're trying to remember so you are expected not only to know the concept but you are also expected to be able to recognize the key concepts related to it that's why i tell people when it comes to these concepts you can't just try to memorize them it never works you have to have an example in, to be able to recognize what they look like in real time. And that's where a lot of self-study programs and materials fall short. Option A, guided discovery. While guided discovery is a technique used in cognitive therapy to help clients explore their thoughts and beliefs, it is more about leading the client to questions and understanding their thought patterns rather than testing beliefs as in collaborative empirism. Guided discovery would be useful, but may not fully engage Jordan in the process of examining and challenging beliefs. Option B, retribution training, is focused on helping clients shift the blame from negative events from themselves to more accurate or external factors. Although this could be helpful for Jordan, it does not directly involve the process of jointly examining the evidence for clients' belief which is critical in addressing Jordan's entrenched negative self view. Option C, decentering. Decentering involves teaching the client to view thoughts and feelings as transient mental events rather than the accurate reflections of reality. While valuable for cognitive restructuring, decentering does not address testing beliefs that is characteristic of collaborative empirism. So again, collaborative empirism is the answer. It's the most appropriate technique for Jordan as it directly engages him in the process of critically evaluating his beliefs 
in developing a more balanced perspective, which is crucial for addressing depression and low self-esteem. This approach not only helps in challenging current negative beliefs, but it also equips students with a set skill to apply this critical evaluation in future situations. It helps them foster a long-term cognitive and emotional resilience. So this is a clinical question for sure, 27% of your exam psychotherapy, clinical intervention, and case management. You would also probably see this also in your master's material. You should see it because even in that section, even though it's not called psychotherapy, it's called intervention with clients, they cover the same interventions. That's a hard section, yes, but you have to have examples of what this stuff looks like. So with that, I know this was a hard day, but I wanted to make sure that I'm doing my job to challenge you. You would rather for it to happen now than on the exam, okay? <laughs> Logan said, dang, Logan, <laughs> you gonna be all right. And I, I know I bust y'all brain cells today, but it's gonna be okay, all right? So with that, I gotta get on out here. You guys can, you know how to find me on Tickety Talk tonight at eight. You can see um, things more visually. We are a week out from my next uh, boot camp. So if you guys still want to join that, definitely, um, you, most of you know, except for any newbies in the room, know how to find me. Um, graduation will be coming up very quickly. So I'm expecting for this group to close very soon. So I, I don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> um, so with that, I hope you guys found this useful. Try not to get caught up in, oh my God, I've gotten one or two questions where I'm going to fail the exam. Get that out of your head. Take it as I learned something new today. Move on, okay? You got to make sure you combat some of those cognitive distortions. Do not catastrophize. It is a learning experience, okay? Y'all got this. I'm out of here because I'm late for my other group. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you so much for hanging in there. Thank you for dealing with the technical difficulties. Thank you, Miss Peaks, for <laughs> helping me hold it down. And thank you guys for your patience as always. I hope the group was helpful. I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Have a good rest of your week. See you next week.